Thank you, uh, Alice, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about our little project. Um, and you, of course, wonder, where is the robot? And I'm, s I'm sorry, we, could, we tried to bring it, but uh, I mean, we have to, if we transport it, it's in a, in a box, which is like a, this long, I think, and that wide and that high. So we have to hire a van, and we organized it, actually, because uh, behind uh, Carol, there are the three students, the three students, Elena, Lenka, and Bram, who have been working on it. And I was supposed to drive the van, but one of them, uh, actually, the, uh, his, her driver's license expired. And uh, so, yeah, <laughs> so we had to cancel it. But uh, we have some videos, and, uh, uh, and you can actually still interact with the robot here. Uh, after my talk, uh, the, the, the students will be here the, the, the whole day. You just approach them whenever you want. You can sit somewhere in a corner because you can interact with the laptop as if it is a robot. Actually, a laptop is a robot without wheels and without legs and arms, basically. And it's the same thing exactly running on the laptop and you can get a feeling of what it is doing. And it's a lot of fun to try it. So, so please just approach them and, and, and try to uh, do a session. And for us, it's also important because we get more experience of what happens there. So, uh, okay, this is the robot, so it'll be, you can let the robot do whatever you want, like this. And this robot is specifically designed, you can see with the blinking eyes and eye contact and also the movement of the hands and arms f uh, to to uh, stimulate social interaction and communication, basically. And people are extremely sensitive to it. And that's also why it's a pity that we couldn't bring the robot here, because it make, it's very impressive. It's almost impossible to suppress your social uh, uh, behavior when you interact with the robot. And you will see that, that even the students that who do this all the time still behave very socially with the robot. But we actually are a group that does uh, a natural language processing, and our research is a bit broader, and I'm running a number of projects uh, on the topic of natural language understanding, and there are a number of issues that uh, are of focus, which is the, the problem of identifying things, how you refer to things, and what is the perspective of the people with respect to the world around them. And we try to use these notions within our, our, our research on natural language understanding, um, where we, of course, we assume there is a world where we all live in, and people observe the world, and the world triggers them to communicate with each other, and then they produce language. So the language cannot be seen separately from that world. It should be connected to the world. And then another human reads this language or hears it and tries to reconstruct something with respect to the world. And there are two problems which are, uh, everybody knows about in natural language processing. That is ambiguity and variation in order to map language to whatever that world is or whatever way somebody perceives that world. And all these variables are ex extremely important to study these phenomena. And in the case of ambiguity, you can say the words have different meanings, so a different sense. But I think a bigger problem is to what they make reference in the world. And that is a, a, a huge problem. I have two simple slides, I'll skip them. Everybody here knows what ambiguity is and how much variation there is in language. So what we do now in this project, we replaced one of the humans by a robot, where we can actually model all these problems up to the, to the bone, I mean, to the really the very, very essentials. And then you see how difficult it is, because this robot perceives the world differently than us. It's in the same physical space, but it will, see, it will interact very differently with that space and have a very different awareness than we have, which makes this communication way more complicated than uh, between humans. Okay, um, um, it's not only complicated with a robot, but we also believe that uh, in the future, when there will be more and more robots and they may have a purpose or a function uh, in our society, uh, communication with these robots plays a very important role. We think the problem is not only complex, but in th I, th I think fundamentally it's impossible to create a perfect machine. So machines will never be perfect. 
There will always be a situation where, uh, uh, which was not anticipated or where the machine learning uh, uh, couldn't uh, uh, match it with anything known in a sensible way, not even with whatever uh, uh, unsupervised data you're using, and it makes a very stupid mistake or it runs into problem. And what do you do if you come across a robot like uh, this one, uh, which is uh, uh, my robot is watching my cat at home, and it does everything correct. It, it, it can see with high confidence that the, the cat has no food and the cat is hungry and it contains, uh, there is a can and it contains food, but the, the developers forgot to, to add a, a can opener to the robot and it cannot open it. So what will the robot do? The obvious thing is you go to a human and you ask for help. So if there is no perfect machine, and robots will run into problems, and humans will run into problems, then the obvious solution is to communicate about the problems that you have. So that's why communication in any kind of system that we have, and I think we shouldn't not only do it with robots, but also with the tech system, you should be able to interact and communicate with them to explain why your situation is different from any of the situations that the, the model can handle. So, okay, this summarizes that. So not only humans make mistakes, but also robots, and the world is complex. So there will be plenty of problems, errors, and conflicts, and the machine will perceive the world in a very different way than humans do. Um, so there's always uncertainty about how language maps to that perceived world. Uh, uh, there is uncertainty about uh, how to solve, uh, 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 what alternative solution to, to, to follow, which solution is maybe the most acceptable. Um, and then we have to think about language as a device to confirm or correct or teach and also negoti negotiate among the system and the robot. And this, some of these aspects we try to build in in our uh, research. Uh, uh, and we, we look at four different types of uh, learning for the robot to deal with uh, 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 situations where it doesn't have the knowledge. So, of course, this robot is uh, doing perception. Yeah, it has sensors that will perceive objects and people, and it will make mistakes, and you can use language to immediately correct the robot if it makes a mistake, and the robot should try to learn from that. And then there is, of course, a lot of structured data out there on the internet in the semantic web, so that structured data can be accessed directly. You get it for free, so why not use it? Yeah, this is everything that we've built up somehow uh, as information and knowledge, and you can access it, and you should be able to use it not only just to read it or, or produce it, but also to apply it in another situation which is useful, of course. And then the world changes all the time, and there are a lot of stories about these changes, and you find them in the news. So another obvious thing is just you let the robot read the news, digest this knowledge, but then again, it needs somehow relate whatever it reads to the world uh, that it perceives. So if it is news about Trump, and the robot doesn't know who Trump is, and it does, uh, he, he will never perceive Trump because it's not in this Trump building, this robot, but it is over here. It makes no sense to the robot. So you, eventually you want to relate whatever the robot is reading to whatever uh, social environment the robot is actually uh, existing in. And then the, 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 the thing that we uh, looked at most in this uh, project is uh, you can just simply talk to the robot. You basically can say anything you want to the robot. Um, and the way we approach this is everything that is talked about uh, in the social interaction is stored. So the robot has a brain, it's just a database, and it will store the result of the processing. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, that also means different people can say different things. So uh, this is a simple implementation where you can see, okay, it's not so difficult to, 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 to process a, a question and send it to any service in the semantic web. What's the speed of light? The rate use of the World Wide Web, brown. The answer is 299,792 kilometers per second. Okay, so these are stupid facts that uh, you can access on the web or through a service like World from Alpha. Uh, and if we think that, uh, okay, you can do this all the time, there is no need to store this information in the brain or, or to, to, to do anything with that, but uh, uh, the robot can access it, should be able to use it, and should be aware about the source. It should know who has this knowledge. But it's got a little bit more complicated if we combine 
uh, uh, perceptions. So here you see there is a white rabbit there, if you can see it, I'm sure, uh, in the middle. Uh, so which is a stimulus, and there are people that receive that stimulus uh, together with the robot. So here we have our students uh, that see the rabbit. We don't know what happens in the brain, and the robot doesn't know what happens in the brain of the students either. But the students talk to the robot about what they perceive. So Selena will say to the robot there, uh, well, robots can bite, and she's a bit, kind of bit uncertain about it. And the robot can, for instance, see this from a, a, a face or hear it in a voice, or she can explicitly say that she is uncertain. And then she will store this as some kind of propositional data in her brain. And Lenka uh, says with a little bit more certainty, well, they can, you can hug a rabbit, and, and Bram confirms that with a lot of certainty, the same proposition. So now there are two propositions, because everything you say to the robot is stored in the brain, so it just accumulates these propositions. But there is a potential conflict between these two propositions. So you, the robot should be able to reason uh, over what biting and hugging means, and that one person is scared and the other ones are happy, which is another type of conflict. But in addition to that, the robot will perceive the same stimulus and maybe the robot, the object recognition, will say, well, that's a cat with a certain confidence. So then there is the perception on which the robot needs to infer, which is in disagreement with the way people talk about, make reference to that perception, being a rabbit, and the robot thinking it's a cat. So that's another type of conflict. So whenever you have this uh, robot, which is kind of a response, which absorbs just knowledge and information that it can get from anywhere and perceiving it, we have to really ask the question, should she believe everything she reads, uh, hears, and sees? Um, and how is she handling these conflicts? What will she do about it? And can, can she trust the humans that tell her all kinds of things? Uh, the news, which is also telling you all kinds of things, or even the web? Uh, or can she trust herself, her own observations? Okay, to handle that, we have a kind of a model, which we call GRASP, that we developed in a group, which is called the Grounded Representation and Source Perspective model, which is an RDF-based model uh, to deal with not only knowledge and information about situations and instances in the world, but also the perspective of the sources on that information. And this is the same uh, representation again, but then we formalized it that um, the, 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 the source that observes something, things in the world or certain situations, so relations between these things, has produced some kind of document and uh, so the source is uh, identified as an, an individual, and we create some kind of a formal attribution relation with whatever uh, document that is produced here and the statements that are made in the document. And these statements, they are pieces of text, so they mention, for instance, things in the world and relations between them, which you can actually point to the part of the signal, the offset, in the document that actually mentions somebody, so you have a semantic model for that. And something or somebody that processes this tries to reconstruct this world of things and situations from the text um, uh, where it needs to figure out that this, this piece of text actually points to an instance of something which is represented as the, the DBpedia URI for Earth. So it has a unique representation. And there is a, a kind of a statement that this Earth is apparently flat, which is represented as a simple triple statement but this source has a perspective and uh, is actually certain and denying that that is true. So we use this model to read the news and represent the content of the news and whatever, who is claiming what, but now we translate this to the robot uh, situation. And in that situation, we again have a world of objects and people and they have properties, so that doesn't change. Now the communication is not by writing, but by speech, uh, in which we have turns at a particular moment of time, somebody is making a statement, a person is the source of the speech, and we have the perception of the sensors that we need to use for face recognition, which again relates to the identity of the source, and also object recognition, which uh, relates to the identifying things in the world. And the attribution information, we use, uh, of course, the audio uh, coming in, so it knows the audio is coming from a person, uh, and a speech recognition to find out what the audio actually presents. And there's a camera with fake recognition which identifies that person as the actual source of the information. And then there's just simple object recognition where the robot is the source of the perception. And for the perspective, all those values like judgments, emotion, agreement, certainty, denial, confirming, 
yeah, you can look at the language, you could look at the face and at the voice. Okay, so one important thing here is that whenever you, the robot interacts with the world in context of people, it needs to know these people. And this is already the first problem, a technical problem, uh, is, uh, that whenever it sees a person and doesn't know the person, it wants to know this, per this person. What's new? I'm Leo Lani. What is your name? My name is Lenka. Okay, is it like <laughs> that? Yes, it is. That makes my day. Let me have a good look at you, so I remember you. So she's not making wow, about I'm happy to meet you, Lenka. Me too. She has to make about 50 pictures of the face in different uh, angles to be able to recognize Lenka uh, in, other, in any other situation. And she builds up a, 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 a representation of the faces in a <coughs> local store of knowledge about her friends. So now she's leaving and she's actually returning. What's going on, Lenka? And I she was thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about you too. <laughs> So all these in, uh, uh, these expressions about think about you are very funny. I mean, you can build in whatever you want, but the essential thing is actually the face recognition and that she has this notion of permanence, that she will see something again that she has seen before and that she just has learned. And she detects it that now as something familiar and not as unfamiliar. Um, so in this process, uh, so it works like this. So uh, recognizing Lenka is the first thing that you do because you need to know that uh, uh, with face recognition that she is somebody already represented in the brain and she's detected as the source of an utterance like Bram, Bram is laughing and Bram is making reference to another person which may not be in the room but may, which she may have as a friend somewhere represented and you translate that through a natural language processing in some kind of proposition or triple representation where Bram is also something in the world and is an actor of a laughing event uh, and maybe you find out that this is a, a plain statement and it's confirming it and maybe she's uncertain because some mood detection will see that she is uh, 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 blinking her eyes too much or whatever. Um, so then this is utterance that you that is expressed at some moment in time. So we formalize this. I'm not going to explain. This is a triple representation of the formal result of that process. I don't think I will explain this very uh, rapidly only. So you have uh, at the top corner uh, the Leonani world instances. Uh, the world consists of Lenka, Bram, uh, a laughing, which is an event, and claims, things being claimed to be true in this world. And there is a, a, a grasp denoted by mapping to a chat one, turn one character off. So there's an utterance represented here through a URI, and you could Store the, you see we store the audio of the utterance as a physical signal somewhere on the disk as well. Um, but this is the abstract representation of that uh, uh, turn. And uh, the laughing itself is also uh, expressed within that turn. Um, and the claim itself, uh, it's, a, it's a statement and it has a subject, uh, that laughing event, and an actor, and the false Brahm. And then there is the perspective, which is actually that this turn, which is a turn, has an actor, which was Lenka. Lenka was a speaker, uh, and it happened at this moment in time. And um, uh, there is a mention which is attributed to Lenka, uh, which is derived from that particular term, and it denotes that particular claim. And there is an attribution, which is an attribution for that particular uh, uh, mention in that turn, and it expresses these values. So it's a complete translation of all those uh, interpretation steps that I just mentioned. Now, now Selena comes in, and she, she, she we, we the robot is a she. She uh, detects Selena as a source, and she denies the same proposition. So we don't need to represent the proposition again because it's already there. It's just the perspective that has changed, and that's at another moment in time. So everything in blue was from the previous slide is there as it is, and the only thing that we need to add. So the claim is up. Oh, sorry, the claim is up there. And there is a new uh, turn where now, oh, sorry, I switched too far. What's going on here? I 
think it should be Selena, not Lenka, in here. Anyway. Yeah, that's the wrong one. Shall we? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Maybe you should give the presentation. <laughs> so at another moment in time, it's uh, attributed to Selena, and it's pointing to exactly the same claim represented once, and now she's denying it. And you can go on like this. So now she, she can come in back, and she can agree with Selena. It's another utterance, and it points back. Uh, this is, of course, extremely difficult to resolve. How do you know that this refers back to the claim? But if you could do it, you could now see that the perspective changed. So you can go into this data set and find all the moments where Lenka believed or didn't believe a certain proposition or anybody else, and at what moments of time communication. That is all recorded. If you would have mood detection, which we don't have, but we could plug it in, the robot can independently watch Bram and check his face and see if he's happy or not happy, if he's laughing or not laughing, and add that to the whole thing. So there is no truth here. There's just claims of different sources and people, and she has to deal with that. Okay, so we do this to show that you can say anything and disagree with the properties that are being uh, mentioned. I have to do some. Uh Greetings, Lenka. You came back. Where are you? Is that Lenka? So this is a graph representing properties of Lenka, and nice. then it should she add a, a new property. It. When she hears it and do you know in the brain. Brand from? Brand is from the Netherlands. And did you know Brand likes romantic movies? Oh, I didn't know that. Yep, those are his favorites. See you later. So the important thing is that uh, not only you can say everything, but uh, for instance, the first, if Lenka says she's from Serbia, she can query the brain to see if other people are from Serbia. And, and since there's nobody there, she's the first one from Serbia she gets, she's knowing. In the same way, uh, querying that uh, different people are saying different things about Bram uh, and responding to that is a way of trying to deal with conflicts and uncertainty in this. So this is the final graph representation uh, where Brahm likes romantic movies, uh, action movies, and science fiction movies. People tell anything to the robot. And the, the romantic movies is uh, uh, expressed in the utterance by Selena at a moment in time. And that is the claim of that. And that it's also expressed by Lenka. And Brahm himself is the source of an utterance where the claim is made that he likes science fiction movies. Okay. So how uh, our implementation of uh, what I do of of this system and uh, the system is actually on GitHub, so so anybody can download it and install the whole thing. Uh, we know you need to install a lot of dependencies. If you manage to do it, it would should be able to run on your laptop without a robot. But uh, if you run a problem, you can contact the the, the students to do it. So of course uh, there is a hardware setup that you need if you run it with a robot. So this robot, uh, it has the sensors like the camera and the the microphone and the 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 uh, uh, the, the speakers, um, uh, and there's not much running on the robot itself, except that it needs to produce the speech. Of course, it needs to run some kind of a text-to-speech uh, uh, thing. Uh, all the other things happen on a laptop or outside the laptop in the cloud, and there is kind of a modem which connects uh, um, uh, any request from the laptop through the internet, and it processes the uh, signal from the robot and sends it to uh, the laptop as well. And on the internet, we use all kinds of things like DDPedia, Google Speech, Wolfram, Alpha. So without a robot, it works as well. Then the laptop is just taking over the role of the robot directly, and you just need an access to the internet, and you use here a microphone and a, a, a camera and the speakers. And you can quickly develop things uh, through that without having to unpack the robot and set up everything. Okay, so the software architecture uh, um, is actually set up uh, now that we made a separation from the intentions of the program, uh, which for, for which there can be many and that will be growing, uh, and an, an application layer that uh, trans maps the, the, the intentions 
to uh, 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 um, uh, actions with respect to particular hardware setups. So, for instance, this is the uh, the, the hardware uh, interface from the Pepper robots, and also the smaller now ones uh, would work with the same uh, 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 API. Uh, this would be of the laptop, and you could actually plug in any kind of hardware specification as long as you follow the, the, uh, the specification of the application layer uh, to use the same functionality. So you can in interact with your refrigerator in the same way and exchange knowledge information as you do with the robot. Um, this is then the way we have set up the whole um, uh, architecture in terms of uh, 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 modules and uh, data uh, uh, processes. So we have four different layers. So the, the bottom layer, for layer one, deals with all the sensors. So we have the speakers, and then there's the, the text-to-speech module is interacting with that one, the microphone, automatic speech recognition, and the camera, face recognition. Um, and that output is given to the next layer, where that is actually controlling the whole process. Um, with intentions such as looking for people, uh, getting to know them and greeting them, or getting introduced, recognize a person, listen to them, what they're saying, or replying uh, something and putting it uh, over there. Um, it's kind of difficult, so there are different types of scripts. That they all have to run simultaneously, um, and that is an extreme burden on, on any kind of, uh, uh, currently we're running on a, on a pretty heavy laptop, but it's apparently also working on a Mac. Um, so we have uh, we've been doing a, a, a re-implementation over the summer to be able to run multiple scripts all at the same time, so that it can can switch from one intention to another one whenever that is needed. Um, uh, and then the output of that is given to the let's say the natural language processing uh, one, that is the third layer, where there is of course a synth some kind of syntactic parser, uh, another classifier, which determines whether it's a question, a statement, or a, a need for clarification. So this is kind of very simple uh, dialogue uh, uh, system, uh, which either results in a query generator, um, which generates a Sparkle query, and it can decide to send it to the semantic web, uh, either to a specific service or, uh, or, or anything you want to implement there, or it will send it to the brain, which is also a triple store, where it stored all information knowledge that it acquired so far. Then the, uh, uh, if it is a statement, it just creates the trip representation of the statement with the source inf information and the perspective and adds those triples to the brain as they are. Um, and if there is a query, the query will result in something and on the basis of the kind of result, for instance, conflicts or zero results, uh, it will generate a particular response and then output it again. Okay, we try to follow this model about the uh, uh, BDI model about belief, desire, intention when we build the whole system. So, the, the, of course, the, the knowledge in the brain, that is uh, what it currently is believing, the current state, um, with the provenance information, and the desire that we define is get to know as many people and many objects, observe as many objects as possible, but also determine, for instance, relevance of these objects, learn as much, as possible about them, and that is defined by some kind of a background ontology, what properties you, uh, are potentially uh, being learned, and resolve these uncertainty conflicts. And then intentions are more specific ones, like uh, establishing an identity, or the getting somebody's name, uh, or confirming their name, check for uh, 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 knowledge on the web for particular objects, and fill slots, etc. So this is, uh, I'm going to skip this, this is, so it's, uh, this is all modeled in some kind of a final state model, so pretty traditional. Um, so I'll go a little bit deeper into these uh, th uh, layers. So for the sensory processing, we use uh, uh, two, two packages. One is the WebRTC um, <coughs> to figure out that there is a voice somewhere active and not, uh, not the, the, the echo or something like that. Um, um, and then, the, then that signal is sent to the Google speech uh, 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 service in the cloud, uh, and that works pretty well. We don't need to do a cleaning. Google says, don't clean, we do it for you. For you. And they, uh, even Google uh, comes back with uh, uh, names that it identifies, but the names uh, is a, uh, detecting uh, names which are non-English or not familiar is a problem. 
And for that, we had to build up a specific uh, 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 solution. So one is, of course, we want the robot to detect things that she knows better than any new th stuff. So her friends, everybody she knew, she should be able to detect that immediately. So my name, Peak, well, forget it. I think nothing works for my name, is it? <laughs> A little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so especially non-English ones, like we want to have Spanish and Dutch names, and, and we uh, probably, well, you can do the Czech name, so we're not going to do that. And uh, uh, we use a labor time proximity with everything, anything that is known, and in and we try to run it through other kinds of speech recognition systems to figure out what somebody's name is. And it's essential in the software. I mean. Uh, if there's a name mismatch, there will be a peak in the brain, and there will be a peak in the brain, and the things they believe are, uh, are assigned to different people, and there's a huge mismatch and confusion, and this chaos is almost unresolvable for the robot. So for the uh, face uh, uh, recognition, we use also available systems like OpenSafe, face uh, neural network representation of a face as a vector. Uh, we present faces uh, in a nearest neighbor model, um, and we try to find the uh, uh, closest face. Uh, and there, of course, the uh, currently we don't do multiple people robot interaction, so we only deal with one face. If, if too many people are standing around the robot, it will get confused because it doesn't know which one, and it's switching all the time. Um, so meeting new people, so as I already told you, you need about 50 samples to represent somebody, <coughs> and, and, and then you need to detect the right name, because it can uh, uh, mismatch the name, somebody hears with the faces, and all, all of those uh, uh, issues. Um, then for objects, we the, I mean, there are various uh, sources, and we are playing with combining them, actually, uh, at the moment. But uh, currently, we're using the Coco Common Objects uh, platform, and the, the downside is, is there's only 90, nine 90, different types of objects that they can detect. So the, the, the world is really very restricted. The advantage is it can detect multiple objects in one uh, scene. Uh, and that is very important because usually it's not a one object, one uh, 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 environment situation. Uh, so it will use some kind of boxing technology to figure out which the different ones are. But of course, uh, uh, 90 is not enough. Um, so we are thinking about uh, 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 first detecting the boxes and then using the other services, which have like uh, a thousand classes of, uh, 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 or 600 classes uh, of uh, objects to figure out more specifically what the kind of things are that are in the environment of the robot. The problem here is the speed. We have to figure out a way to do this very rapidly. Speed is, is, is continuously a an issue. If the robot responds too long, it uh, takes too long, to process the speech or to answer a question, people are already saying something else, and everything gets mixed up. So the performance is extremely uh, important here. Okay, so this is how object recognition works, just as it is. I see a person. Hello. 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 Yes, yes. Yes. Hello. 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 This is a dog. <laughs> you see a dog, but I don't see it. I did not know what dog is, but I searched on the web and I found that it is a mammal. I will remember this object. I see a dog. Well done. <laughs> was a teddy bear first, so it, it still saw the teddy bear, and then it, re it learned that it was a dog. So now she's seen a teddy bear and a dog, actually. Uh, and it, at, uh, if she would store all the images that it took while perceiving it, then she would have one set of images with two labels. One was wrong according to human, and the other one was right according to human. 
Uh, we're not storing all of that yet, but we are really planning to do this uh, at some moment in time. And you could see that she could list everything she has seen. So this is, she has infinite memory. She will f not forget anything. <laughs> That's fantastic, isn't it? Um, uh, the other thing is you saw that she was not only looking at what you're holding, she's observing everything all the time. I mean, her eyes are kind of confusing. She's not only looking like that, she's also looking like that. I mean, she's almost seeing everything. So, but you see that language processing interacts with the perception already here. And so the language processing module, uh, of course, we get from the speech recognition from Google in an utterance. We need to keep track of the chat ID and the speaker information. We do the classification statement question. We store triples or we have W questions or verbal questions, which we translate to Sparkle queries and we generate them. So it's not simple natural language processing as we normally do because we had to make all kinds of adaptations. So it's kind of interesting. We had to basically start from scratch. We have a grammar, we follow some very simple SVO order, but there are all these dialectic relations pointing to the outside world, which we have to take care of, which is not different than you do if you do just text. Um, so we have to detect the reference to the speaker, the hearer, the entities, but also the objects. Actually, the objects are inside the grammar. So, um, and we have to translate everything to something that we can represent in the triples. So there is a, a kind of a Montague syntax mapping from syntax to semantics. Um, we use some external models like uh, NLTK, we do verb lemmatization and Stanford NER, but only when we need it because it's too slow, it generates more useless stuff than useful stuff, so we really have to decide when we use it. We have some kind of a handmade simple lexicon, and we, of course, the communication itself, we, uh, the robot is just uh, learning new labels for things all the time, so the lexicon grows pretty rapidly. The lexicon specifically is necessary to map uh, uh, to the properties that we model in an ontology. Uh, we do self-reference resolution with speaker generation. And uh, I think, yeah, the results, of course, you can have a, you have a list of results always. It can be zero, and you have to respond differently, and it depends on the fact that different people, similar people, say the same thing that you have to respond to in the language uh, generation part. So this is just a, a, a what we call this, a, I call this a perceptual phrase grammar. It's not this, just a simple phrase grammar, but there are uh, perceptual elements like this one, which is represents the object detected, referenced to uh, either uh, directly or implicitly in the utterance. That needs to be dealt with whenever you interpret the expression and translate it to a uh, triple representation. Okay, then for the knowledge representation, we use a lot of stuff there. General ontologies like RDF and time to reason over time. We have uh, the simple event model to represent situations in which people are involved. Uh, we use the provenance model to link it to sources. We have our grasp for the perspectives. And we have uh, uh, for the social data, uh, general ontology like four of and geonames. And we created our own ontology, which is more or less represented here, which uh, models all the properties that matter when people do social interaction. So uh, uh, people belong to uh, an organization, they are from a place, or they live in a place, which can be city countries, they have different interests, and that drives actually the hunger not to know people, but also to know about people that it interacts with. So it tries to fill slots, basically, uh, uh, as a drive. Uh, so the queries that you can run, you can run a lot of different queries. Social queries, like how many friends do you have? Um, uh, who are your best friends? the ones you talked to mostly, uh, uh, w with whom did you talk lately, uh, uh, and, um, um, uh, and when did you talk to people, uh, but also uh, what kind of things do you know, like all the list of everything you know, uh, how many things, you can uh, count things. Um, um, uh, the names, labels, and we described already the kind of a learning uh, 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 approach that whenever something is unknown, what it is, it can actually access DBpedia and learn directly about these things, trying to figure out what it is. So this is a simple Sparkle query, like this one. So uh, uh, figuring out something which is an experience in a moment of time involving an actor, it's denoted by an utterance, uh, would give you just a list of everything she has seen 
in a split second. Uh, so a bat, a bird, a book, a bottle, etc. Just an example of how it works, and this is a video pre-presenting <laughs> learning. Amazing, I see a dog. No, not again. So there you see the box in there. And you could also see, I mean, that's all these confidence values, like a person, uh, 22%, and I think the teddy bear is there, is, I can't see how much it is, something, uh, uh, all the time. Um, and then learning about objects is another <coughs> one. I see a clock. There is no clock. You don't see a clock, but I see it. <laughs> This is a remote. I see a remote. You see a remote. I see a remote. <laughs> Two. I am sorry. I did not learn anything on remote, so I will not remember it. Mm. I see a banana. Yeah. This is my banana. Have we already seen that? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? This is my banana. You own a banana. <laughs> True. What about this? Can you see an apple? I see a sports ball. No. No, yes. I cannot see a leg An apple. Can you see an apple? Tell me, can you see an apple? No, I cannot see an apple. This is an apple. You see an apple, but I don't see it. I did not know what apple is, but I searched on the web and I found that it is a eukaryote. I will remember this object. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think uh, I have to go to this one. So basically, we have the apple now represented in the brain because. Uh, somebody said something about it, a property, or she learned the property, or she learned that her, her original perception was wrong and she had to perceive it differently. That is the only reason why we store objects in the brain, because she is scanning objects all the time, she will see uh, the same things all the time, we don't want to store everything, only the important or relevant things that are commun communicated somehow. So uh, this was the dog, which she uh, found out that it was a mammal in DDpedia, and uh, I think bird, it uh, made a mistake, and I thought it was uh, actually uh, the bird, the band, uh, of a band, and, and, and not a an, uh, mammal. So it will also learn wrong things from the web, which are not wrong on the web, but they are wrong in the reference relation to the thing outside. Okay, uh, so this is a, a, a visual graph representation, so Lenka, has, uh, you cannot really read it, but she has seen many things. Uh, she is from Serbia. Uh, she has seen a remote. She has seen a dog and a bird. Her favorite is a cake, but she hasn't seen a cake. But Leonali has seen a cake in another uh, session uh, and seen various things like bananas, books, cats, dogs, chairs, everything she has perceived in, in the world. And of course, the, the knowledge that an apple is a eukaryote. Okay, and now, of course, you can combine that, that with, the, for instance, the ownership. You've seen a few examples, and I think this is the last movie we have, um, that uh, um, uh, what people tell about the objects can actually also be conflicting. So, so it's not only abstract knowledge, but also perceptual uh, relations. Oh, yeah, I have to. Oh, no, it comes up automatically. I see a person. Hello, Serene. Mm -hmm. Who owns a book? You told me you own a book in 
Okay, so this brings me actually to the end uh, of the presentation. Um, um, of course, I mean, we, you have to realize we started this project a year ago uh, with uh, three students working one day a week, uh, one of them two days a week, actually. And we continue this with another year, another student joining. And we hope to, act this was kind for us, playing and playing what do we do with these concepts, uh, identity reference perspective within these uh, robot settings. And we hope to continue this into uh, more uh, what I think should be then turn playing into research. And um, for the first thing we need to do, we need to figure out some kind of evaluation framework for this. Um, um, and there are a lot of uh, huge, uh, a lot of exciting things to work on uh, uh, with the sensors, of course, uh, multimodal communications, gestures, but especially pointing to things in the environment. Uh, the robot should point, the human should be able to point. Uh, the facial expressions, tone of voice, already mentioned that. That will be important to figure out the perspective of people on the situations or uh, that, that, that are actually the case. Uh, object instance detection and quantification. So you, if you saw the examples that the book got a unique URI in the brain. So there's only one book in the whole world. All books perceived will just map to the same book in the current model. So we need to represent, we just have an instance rep concept representation that we now represent as an instance and we need to turn it into a real instance representation so that you can count how many books there are and actually if she detects a book she needs to know which of all the books this particular book is uh, and maybe even which copy of a book if you're talking about ownership of a book because different people can own the same book which is not the same physical book but is you know, the thing you paid for, if you paid for it. Um, and then, of course, property detection. So we just uh, uh, want not only, we, we want to uh, detect potential relations automatically. So if you carry something, you may be owning it. Uh, uh, so it's not so, and then go to more difficult sceneries, of course, in, at some point. But with ownership, I think, and quantification, that you can already uh, study a lot of very interesting uh, aspects. Uh, well, co-reference resolution, so some of it is already being built in, but there's a lot of work that we can extend. Uh, uh, in relation to the pointing, of course, the didactic references uh, uh, need to be uh, uh, improved as well. Uh, we have negation in it, but there's a lot of more work to do, and also detecting certainty in emotions. Currently, it's just certainty in processing the signal, and we still need to, to figure out how we uh, uh, derive certainty information from the actual expressions themselves, like uh, uh, using a uh a lot or, 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 or pausing or uh, correcting and things like that. And uh, uh, we can, of course, uh, expand the recall of the system by using any kind of resource like awareness or embeddings uh, and also to generate more varied responses, although there is a risk doing that. Uh, ontology learning, so not just learning about instances, but also learning about concept relations about instances. So there's a lot more to learn from uh, on an apple than uh, uh, than than we've shown here. Um, and uh, of course, uh, representing in our brain these objects as, as instances and groups of uh, instances, uh, well, will 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 generate a lot of formal semantic uh, problems that people have been working on in the past and now suddenly become actual or, or real also in, in the current setting. And we have to somehow find a solution for that. Okay, well, that's it. So uh, I also want to thank Selena Coleman. She has been uh, doing a lot of work to prepare the videos for today. Uh, she's now here. And the students, of course, and Bob van Graft, uh, because he and I together bought the robot so that they could do the, the, the research and, of course, the funding from the uh, National Science Organization. Thanks. That was my pleasure.
So I start just from the yeah, list. Yeah. I mean, so so I haven't worked personally on mood detection at all. So I, I can imagine that it is uh, like speech recognition and other techniques, generic technology, um, uh, uh, and uh, trained with data, which is of course biased to particular people and, and focusing maybe on simple uh, detections are not very fine-grained ones. So personalization, I think, yes, is always important. Um, I don't think we will start with this one, but we, we are, uh, we already do it in that detecting everything that is in the brain gets priority over anything generic. Uh, of course, we, it's difficult for us, for us to, to interact with generic services. So we cannot change the Google speech service. We cannot uh, 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 manipulated in a way that we uh, uh, provide more data so that Google will behave differently uh, more uh, for the world of the of this robot um, and but we really would like to do it so maybe at some point we will kick out Google and use something else which is more open so that we can uh, mix the uh, uh, all for instance the your voice which is has uh, uh, she has been hearing a lot she should know your voice and know how you speak or I speak or anybody else. And the same is for mood detection. So if, if I, a system would say, oh, you look sad, and you say, no, I don't look sad. People say this all the time. Uh, I always look sad, but I'm not sad. Then I want the robot to keep this information and use it at some point. Uh, and that's really a challenge. And uh, uh, so this all this uh, personal contextualized data, and this grows rapidly in this setup, <laughs> It's 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 way more important than waiting on the next version of the Google API. So I hope I answered the question. Who ever asked the question? <laughs> so the second question is actually mine, so I can I can uh, rephrase it. Uh, I wonder whether when you use uh, actually RDF triplets for uh, the brain representation, yes. uh, whether this uh, formalism is uh, capable uh, to express uh, say. I mean, for the for the for, for representing the news, we we do uh, use the same model to represent speculated uh, uh, events, uh, events from the here and now or from the far past. Uh, so we there is uh, some reasoning over over tense and time built in, and uh, uh, the the actual world modeling is simpler than the language modeling. I would say so. The the systems that need to, to reason over. Uh, how to get from the language expression to this uh, representation in the, uh, let's say, the world representation in RDF. Uh, that is more complicated than the actual world representation, which is the result. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, uh, 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 so we can say that something is in the future, and then it has no timestamp, but only a timestamp relative to whatever uh, the time of the discourse is. Uh, and we don't need to formally represent that. So we can represent it uh, uh, in a undefined period using time owl, basically. You can do that. Uh, but the, the other stuff is really complicated. So we, so in the news we use, uh, it's actually developed by the people in Trento, uh, the uh, a time uh, pro module, which is reasoning over all temporal information, which includes tense also, and uh, the discourse, the document creation time, and uh, 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 the time expressions that you find in a document to reason over every instance of an event, where when it probably where it should be placed on a timeline yeah. somewhere. So I think you can get pretty far with what there is. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so we can use uh, possibly. So, so the quantification thing is another issue. So, so we were we uh, we actually decided to cre cre create uh, group entities as instances, as a separate layer of entities, mm -hmm. and uh, and that can be 
underspecified that you don't know how big the group is or uh, uh, yeah and then I mean if you would formally represent uh, every Monday to infinity <laughs> that would be a function because <laughs> you can't make it explicit so we don't have those functions but we do have uh, uh, things like uh, properties of the group which can be uh, uh, huge or enormous something like that so so completely everything formally it's that I don't that we don't have a solution for everything but we can approximate these things the question is what it means for a person so what would it mean for me that somebody will do something every Monday for the rest of of uh, as long as I live I, I, I can't represent it either I, I mean I cannot uh <laughs> So I don't know how far you should go doing that, but uh, yeah, yeah. So not everything is possible, but you can do more uh, pretty easily uh, with machine and risk than, than you would assume, I think. Yeah. Okay, next question. So how does the robot react to a person who refuses to communicate with Oh, I don't know. So, so a person unknown, will she continuously try to contact the person? Yeah. Infinitely. Until? Until? Oh, but object like oh, oh, she's distracted by something yeah, else. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So we haven't built in something like, no, I don't want to communicate with you. We were thinking about privacy issues, so because she's, she's storing personal information. So I think that the next version should first ask if that is okay, if you're okay with that. So sh she has to warn people that she's storing properties. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and of course, you can delete that easily. I mean, we ha since you have the provenance trails, you can just delete everything related to any. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Here's a form. Fill it in. Yeah. Well, we kind of answered that already. Just, just now. I mean, you can specifically delete uh, a anything coming from a particular person, kind of easily. That would be just one sparkler query, at one I think, and then an operation to remove it from the brain, and then it's gone. The the only thing is that we still have so we are storing some other stuff outside the brain for the moment, like uh, for instance the audio, face factors, stuff like that. So there has to be a follow up, I guess, <laughs> after the sparkler query to do it. Okay. Yeah, well, one is a static property and the other one is a dynamic one where you have world knowledge about how n long laughing normally lasts that you should be able to use at some point. So, so static properties can be true for forever. And uh, 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 and that is, of course, a stupid example. I mean, we don't represent these things. At ownership, for instance, yeah, how long does somebody own a book until something else happens that you give it away as a present to somebody else and you no longer own it? So we <coughs> we actually have uh, some kind of an ontology on on events that that rep that models the 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 pro and post situation of events, so what has actually changed. So with ownership, it's, uh, we have quite a, uh, a, a rich representation for that. So all kinds of events that have an impact on ownership, we can model that, that if that event is reported, that there is a moment in time that the ownership was like this, and after that the ownership is different, somebody else owns it, and so then uh, uh, it, uh, um, the ownership relations in I think I didn't represent that, but in the uh, simple event model, you do have time anchoring of uh, events. So you will you will store the when an event happened, and you can store the beginning and the ending. Uh, so also the duration of events, you can model that. So that's all part of the temporal reasoning <laughs> that you you mentioned too. Um, so in the case of 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 this interaction, uh, I think that uh, uh, that will be more difficult because. We don't have, for instance, information about how long laughing will take or being sad or happy takes normally. So, uh, uh, and she, she, will ha she, ha she will have to reason over uh, 
the, the stative expressions that somebody is sad or happy or somebody is laughing at some point, then if somebody is laughing at a later point of time, then the other state is now invalid. That kind of reasoning is not there. That really needs to be built. So reasoning about the emotional state as implication of all of behavior. So that would invalidate a, a claim at some point. <laughs> because the ladies decided that it is a she. <laughs> and and Bram and I didn't mind. So it's easier to give her, it's easy, so the reason to give her a gender, we co talked about that, should she be neutral or not neutral? Should she have a personality or not a personality? But the reason to give her a gender and a name is that it is much easier to talk about her than it all the time or uh, something like that. So we don't do anything with that except talk, make it easier to talk about her. Um, but you could think about personalities, building personalities as well, and other uh, things. But there is a something built in, but now we can actually use Google voices, uh, which are way more human-like. And so, I didn't like the word. I think you didn't like it. Yeah, I thought that in, from the point of view of intelligibility, yeah, it yeah. suffered a little. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the one you get for free when you get yes. the robot. So, <laughs> so there is also speech recognition there. So a lot of things you get when you buy it is really yeah. crap. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then you have to look for something. And, uh, but we, we, are, we have now actually the possibility to use a better voice. Uh, that voice yeah. is a bit childlike, yeah. but uh, it suffers from the point of view intelligibility. We can see that it's very, uh, it has been artificially distorted, probably from a uh, very short female voice mm. to a uh, so-called child voice. I don't know, it's Japanese. It's Japanese. Sorry. Now, it's I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, we, we will specific. Of course, you can do that, and we, but we we want to focus on, for instance, reasoning on conflicts and uncertainty. So uh, Selene is working on conflicts. So I mean, like I said, is that that's something you can hook or that it bites and that scares one person and it makes another one happy. Is that in conflict? Yes or no? You can make this really it's pretty difficult reasoning about that. So so that is something that we are working on now and also. Uh, um, a learning that if you if you acquired you've seen something you know what kind of thing it is what other things are there uh, um, so uh, which are similar to that and uh, so she could now also start looking for things she hasn't seen and so using reasoning in, in terms of uh, uh, extending the coverage of her experiences and building up knowledge about that that's something else that we are thinking of so, so, but the, uh, currently the conflict thing is the one that we really are, are working on. Uh, and coffee, well, there, well, it's over there. So, <laughs> but uh, actually, we are working with the computer science department where they do a lot of the reinforcement learning things, and they typically uh, build robots that have to uh, get coffee and then have to learn how to get coffee through reinforcement. And we are thinking about a project, but just an idea that that I think is more interesting than getting coffee. So that will be a, a guide robot for blind people where we think that it has a real purpose and there's a lot of functionality to offer. So we think that is more interesting. So there's a lot of things that from our project and their project that would come together. And uh, so that's a, a more serious thing than, than, than bringing coffee. But it is interesting if to include movement, getting into other situations, observing it, interpreting it, and then communicating about to another person which cannot see that and reason over that. Uh, I think there is a lot of useful functional behavior and communication that you can build in there. Hmm. Like an object detection, uh, if I uh, rotate the robot, I change the orientation. Yes. Will it detect uh, that it is 
What will, will the robot like, detect that? Yeah, like that this is mobile. Yeah. So if I keep like in this, yes. it will it detect it? That is mobile. Will it detect that it's now looking at another yeah. side of the room, you mean? I mean, no, if I check that, it's going show it like this. Will it see? Oh, still see it. No, well, that depends on how the object recognition is, uh, what kind of training they gave it on data. With the faces, you saw Lenka turning her face so that she will uh, see her, her face in different angles to, to recognize it better. So it's currently, it's just the Coco, Coco database uh, that is used for the object recognition. So uh, uh, if you want to be able to do that, yeah, it, it is the training data for the neural network that you have to uh, work on. And it makes it makes a lot of mistakes. If you have a coffee mug and you don't show the ear, it will not detect it. So if you turn it the wrong way, then forget it. <laughs> Who was first? So I think it's okay. just a brief comment. So maybe I would just recommend to focus also on the audio perspective of recognizing persons, for instance. Like I guess there are some. So it's yes. to recognize somebody based on voice yes. or even to recognize yes. something in the yes. environment of robots based on yes. sound and you know, yes. like voice yes. or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not yes. just yes. vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. possibilities yeah. of extension and here. It's already very complex, but yeah, there's a lot of things to do. I really like the complexity of this, actually. Yeah. So. Uh, it's just a comment. Uh, why do you really need to uh, ask a person for their name? Since you're taking pictures anyway, you can do a quick Google query and match <laughs> the lines and say, oh, you're Mike. And in fact, if I say, no, I'm Jim, he's going to say, you were lying to me. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we actually thought about that to, to solve this problem, but uh, we haven't built it yet. That, yeah, it's an option to, to look into. Well, we kind of solved it a little bit with the name thing. It also has a tabloid. You could actually write your name <laughs> on the tabloid. <laughs> Okay, thank you.